Okay. Um, thanks for coming. I uh, hope everyone's had a good KubeCon. Uh, uh, when I first proposed this talk, this was actually kind of a little bit cynical. And based on the description in the um, schedule, I've changed it a little bit, but I've kept the parts that I think are most applicable to people who are coming to KubeCon. Um, so what we're going to cover, um, our story, I work for a company called Lytix, and we transitioned to Kubernetes from GCE and jumped onto the GKE system. So this is kind of the story of how we went, we transitioned fr from GCE to GKE, and the stumbling blocks that we kind of ran into along the way, as you can guess from the theme of Oregon Trail. Um, we ran into some issues, overcame some stuff, and kind of ended up in an interesting place that not a lot of companies seem, I don't think a lot of companies ended up in our position, but I think we actually uncovered some cool stuff along the way. So who am I? Uh, my name is Josh Ropo. Um, that's actually not on the slide, which is great. Um, I've been doing data engineering and platform infrastructure engineering for most of my short career, about six years. Uh, I'm a gopher, and I really like Kubernetes. Um, I'm definitely a user, though. I haven't contributed to core, and I haven't really had the time to dive like super deep into stuff, but uh, I'm trying to stay up on the trends and where things are going. Uh, I like asking why and doing thoughtful design of systems and trying to do things as good as well as possible. And I don't like being woken up at 3 in the morning when Elasticsearch goes down. Um, and uh, I like stable infrastructure platforms, which is primarily why I was so interested in Kubernetes when it started coming on the scene a couple of years ago. And so stability, it's a good thing. So the Lytix story. Um, we're a customer data platform for marketers and web developers. Uh, we enable personalized web uh, interactions. So the classical example is the recommendation engine for on Amazon. So you look at a page, and then you see the other items that you might be interested in. We enable you to, based on content recommendation and machine learning, we enable you to create a list of, from we we can tailor personalized experiences to your users based on our generic engine and entity resolution. Um, we were standardized on Go since 0 0.9. Um, so we've been a Go shop for a long time. We have a little bit of R and Python to support. And originally, the first, one of the first things I did at the company was we were on AWS. We moved to G Google Cloud Platform for, because of stability and performance. Um, we started adopting a lot of their technologies to replace uh, things like Kafka. So Kafka was a place with PubSub, Cassandra was a place with Bigtable. Um, it's been a really nice platform to build on. And as far as the spectrum of monolith versus microservices, we're kind of, on, we're kind of in the middle right now. Um, we haven't gone full microservice adoption, but uh, we're, not, we're not tied down to a single monolith. So we have an API tier, we have a workflow management tier, which we call Metaphora, and then we have an event stream, and I'd, we have a stream processing system that's distributed across a number of group of deployments, and that does entity resolution, um, machine learning classification in real time. Um, so where we came from, we were originally on SaltStack, and that is both powerful and terrifying. Um, it's a you can take YAML, run it through a Jinta template, and then generate more YAML based on that. So it's a very complex system, but it is pretty powerful. Um, so obviously, I'm not going to get into why Kubernetes were at KubeCon. We all know all the great points of what Kubernetes is good at. But for us, it was primarily the idea of going into VM management is not very appealing, because you have to build all these heavyweight tools around it. And we're deploying a single binary. So de Building all of these, using all these heavy tools to manage things like operating system kernels, managing all those upgrades, it just is overburdensome for just trying to deploy something very simple. So when we, Kubernetes started coming on the scene, we're like, this is this is good because we had played around with Docker, but anyone who's tried to deploy just Docker to production knows that that doesn't go very well. Um, <clears throat> so the goals of moving to Kubernetes, we eventually want to get everything on Kubernetes. Right now, we are only about we only have our own core application services in Kubernetes, but um, we're working on trying to get our other dependencies in there as well. 
we run a few etcd clusters and etcd is kind of a core heartbeat for our distributed uh, distributed system mechanisms so uh, So one complication that you do kind of see and it's kind of visible on the screen is that we have uh, a deployment system called Link Grid, which can be scaled from one, we, we might need to have from anywhere between one to n number of these deployments. And up front, that creates a little bit of an issue because that means you're gonna have to define YAML or template YAML declarations for these deployments from one to n. And so I wanted to come up with a, or I wanted to have a good solution to manage that going forward. So, and before we could even get to there, we had to do some application preparation. Um, a lot of our services were kind of built in the older model where local state was available and it would be there with your service crash and then came back up. So we had a few things like bolt DB files that were on a server and if something crashed, it was checkpointing its last location and but in the Kubernetes world, if you kill a pod, it needs to be able to reschedule it somewhere else and it won't have that state anymore. So you have to build, rebuild your application um, to accommodate that fact that persistent storage shouldn't be a thing and you should always use distributed stores like GCS, maybe Ceph, just something that's over the network. Um, we also really utilize a lot the HTTP pre-stop hook, which enables us, in a few cases, we have long-running workflows with integrations with, exter with external services that in the case of shutdown, they, if you're, we have rate limits on some of the integrations we work with. And if we're just like able, only able to trickle data and they, there's no checkpointing that they allow just because their API doesn't support it, we need to be able to let that finish. So the HPPT stop hook on a pod is actually super useful in that case. And it's been pretty rock solid. So when you request a pod to terminate, it actually does wait that full time because effectively the way we use it, we use it, it opens a connection and then you just hold that connection open and until you're ready to shut down, you just hold it and then when you release it, the pod terminates and it uh, gets cleaned up. So Kubernetes doesn't hard kill it right before it, uh, right when you send the stop command. Um, so this took a little while before we finally got all of our services aligned up to work well in the Kubernetes deployment model. Um, once we got there though, or another thing we ran into was we have heterogeneous workloads. So across some of our workflow machines, and we have like some processes that will consume way more CPU than others, and depending on where they get distributed to in a, a set of pods, like there might be one workflow that uses 100% of the CPU and for a few minutes and then shuts down, and others, there might be five others that don't. So you can have one, C, one there, there, there's a few different vectors of uh, resource allocation on this. So, um, sorry, I'm blanking right now. In, we have some clients which can, using this, we have some clients which using the same workflow, like an export to Facebook or something, my, or BigQuery is a good one, will consume a lot of resources on that one pod. If it's a smaller account, it might be burst for only a little bit, but it's a flat distribution across a set of pods. Um, so if in the VM system where it's hard to create and allocate VMs just because it's a little bit ops intensive and something you don't want to do very often, you end up having to buy more compute than you actually need. So you end up in the situation where you're just wasting money um, one of the really cool things about Kubernetes is that there's a difference between what you schedule pods for and what they actually are limited to. So if a pod needs to burst for a single workflow, it can. Um, it just for simplicity's sake, uh, on the VM utilization, let's say that there is one, there's one pod that actually is running hot most of the time. And let's just say hypothetically that these other ones are kind of hanging out, not doing a whole lot. Well. With Kubernetes Scheduler, if you use, if you combine all those into say like a two core machine, you could schedule all of these VM, all of these, all of these pods onto the same VM, and the, requ the, the Kubernetes Scheduler will assign all of those to one, pod, one 
we'll be able to schedule all of those onto one VM, but they'll actually be limited to, they will, they will be limited to only running on, using one core at a time. But if they all buffer up to the point of, or if they're all limited by CPU, they won't be killed. So they can all fight over CPU, but chances are if they're all running along at this um, average percentage usage, they will actually be able to fit nicely into that VM. <clears throat> so on the trail to Kubernetes, uh, obviously YAML, lots and lots of YAML. Um, I'm not the only person who thinks this, and it's, you know, some people love YAML. I'm on the opinion that coming from salt, white space is difficult to think about sometimes. And the fact that YAML doesn't have any termination characters means that you can't format it. So there's a lot of times when YAML just becomes more confusing than you would like it to be. And managing tons of YAML files, it's like, Unless you have scripts to, uh, I, th getting back, I think for static resources and rules like your RBAC consider like your RBAC settings and services, I think it works fine because those things don't change very often. But for things that you might want to manage and update regularly, um, it seems like they're or, or create that one to n number of. I think it's a little bit problematic because you're gonna have to manage it somehow. So obviously Helm is uh, one of the popular YAML templating engines and that's not necessarily, it. like Helm is a pretty cool system but it's still that templating engine. Um, I think that the, yeah, the tiller design is actually pretty good but I think we can do better than YAML for like our own application stuff. Um, and now that, you know, it's KubeCon, so there's a bunch of cool announcements like Kaysan, it looks pretty interesting, and there's other things like Compose, but again, you're taking like a Docker file and you're converting it into another type of YAML. Um, so just as an example, we can actually use Go to, uh, actually, that's out of order. So another option, client.go. Uh, it's a client library. It's extracted from the actual Kubernetes repo, so it's not quite as much code that you need to import. Um, if you've used it before, you've probably experienced some pain. It's a little bit tricky to get organized correctly the first time you set it up because the dependencies are complex, but it does afford some pretty cool stuff. So initially, I jumped into it because I'm a bit of I like Go more than I like YAML, so I was like curious to see, all right, is this going to work out well? And you're compiling against the Kubernetes source code, which is really nice because, you know, like I would often find myself in the early days of Kubernetes, like looking at YAML files, trying to figure out like what went where, and there would be mismatched versions and examples, so like sometimes you'd find something that was using a certain structure a certain way, and then like you have to match that up, and you pretty much end up digging into the code anyway. So at this point, it's like, well, if we're going to have to dig into the code, why don't we just use the code itself? And one of the cool things about actually writing the library is that, or using client.go, is that when you run compile, everything is type checked. That's really nice. Like you know at least when you run go build that everything lines up correctly. Um, so this is kind of like an equivalency. On the, on the top, there is a YAML definition, and on the bottom, there is the same thing written in, specified in, the, in Go. And as you can see, YAML is more, a little bit more concise and a little bit more readable, but the verbosity of the Go example is very, it's nice and clear. Um, we have hard typed fields like name and volume source, which define how you need to build this structure. And at any point, you can actually dig into these types and uh, actually see what the documentation is and how it's supposed to be used. So uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about that in VS Code. So right here, this is an actual example that I've been working on for the past couple days, uh, trying to make it an example for people to start 
using the client.go, and it's just like, you can just pick this up, uh, pick up this library, and start playing around with it, because everything's already vendored, everything is already um, defined, so like, you can just pick this up and start playing around in this, uh, packet, in this Git repo. But in this example down here, we're creating a v1, an API v1 beta 2 deployment. Obviously, uh, we're still running into the numerous number of versions in here with, of Kubernetes deployments. But if we highlight this deployment, we can see a nice little structure definition pop up. And then we can dive into what the type actually is. So now we're actually diving into the Go defin or the client dash Go library. So we've jumped into the vendor folder, and now we're in the type of deployment. So now we can see that there's four fields on this type, and these are the specs. So this is the deployment spec. Hit control, dive into it. Now we can see all of the fields on this, and we get nice. I mean. It's code, so it's not like a nice HTML. It's not a nice HTML page, but this is the documentation for what Kubernetes is actually using under the hood. Okay, so the first thing I kind of did after digging into the client dash go library was I built a CLI tool just to like kind of see like does this work, and. Initially, it was just like list the pods from some kube context. So the cool thing about building a CLI tool is that you use the same kube config file, and you just specify at at, with flags and parameters to the client uh, creation function uh, which kube context you want to use. So if you're running minikube, you would pass minikube. And I have an example of that later. Um, so uh, Lytics, we actually started using this to define some of our deployment objects. And I actually created a superset object on top of that called a deployment set, which is effectively a specified set of deployments that all share roughly the same type, but are just like named, have separate names and separate, uh, a, a few different fields like metadata tags to define their role. So in prod, we have about 10, and in staging we have three. And, but those are very clean to create because effectively you just create a nice static function which defines all of them. Um, so we still use kubectl in our deployments, which is unfortunate. Uh, I would like to live in the world where Kelsey Hightower's demos are because those are great, but we're not quite there yet. Um, rigging is a pretty limited scope. It just does creation. Um, the there are flags to mutate uh, the types at runtime, so or not at runtime, but at creation, so we can update the number of CPUs that we want to use. Do we want all of the pods to have re allocated to them? Um, just a few things about if you are building a CLI, uh, make sure you specify and make sure that the user is defining which kube context they're actually trying to use. Um, kubectl is actually kind of loose on that, which I find surprising. Like, you don't actually have to specify the context. It'll just use whatever you have configured in your kube config, which is a little, little risky, because Kubernetes has never made it easier to I accidentally the whole cluster. But, uh, and then also semver all of your, all of your deployments. Um, obviously, Kubernetes is moving really fast, and that's great. But it also means, from a user's perspective, stuff is moving really fast, and things are changing out from underneath you regularly. On the right, there is a list of SIGs of uh, special interest groups, and this only goes to C. Uh, there's a lot of SIGs out there, and it's hard to pay attention to all of them. Um, things like replication controllers, third-party resources, those are already dead at this point. Uh, you shouldn't be using them, and I know that talking to people here at KubeCon, everyone is kind of, all the users of Kubernetes are kind of dealing with this. But the, everyone on the, everyone who's actually building Kubernetes wants to go faster. Like they want releases every month, not every two, not every few months. So we're in this like weird kind of. It's described. I heard uh, Tim Hawken describe it as a U shape, where like we're in the bottom, and everybody like users want it to go slower, and the developers want it to go faster. Um, and back when Kubernetes was unversioned, it was kind of the wild west. You were always in the code trying to figure out what stuff was actually doing. Um, so surviving all of these changes, uh, the client-go library has had a rough history. 
I started using it at the client Go version 1.4, and it was like, oh, yeah, this is kind of cool. And then 1.5 came out, and they created another path for the 1.5 client, and they just shoved everything in there. And then they kind of realized, oh, this was a bad idea, because we're just appending tons of code to the same Git repo. So they ripped that out in version 2. And then from then on, uh, things got a little weird. You can see this matrix uh, on the bottom right. And the check marks are where things all just line up well. Um, so we finally have reached a solid point with uh, client go, the client Go version 5 and Kubernetes 1.8. So things are actually lined up at this point, which is a really nice thing. And if you need to update from 1.5 to 5, I actually have a document which I need to write a blog post about, which is about how things change and where your things shifted around to, because it definitely got weird. But things are improving a lot. So from going forward, I would I hope that things are stable now, and it'll be a lot simpler to upgrade. Um, so again, when you're, if you decide to use client go, think a bit about your design. Look at how the interfaces you or look at the interfaces of the types that you're going to be interacting with, and think about it a little bit. There's some chaining that goes on that makes some of the client go functions a little bit hard to use. So think about it before you jump into it. Um, vendor everything. If like, make sure there is no code that is coming out of your Go path. And there are some issues with DEP right now. On uh, at Lily's talk yesterday, um, she mentioned that RBAC has a little few issues. So if you try to use RBAC in client in the latest version of Client Go, there you might run into some issues with some API versioning. And that's kind of, that's a bug in DEPs actually right now. They're trying to sort that out, but be wary. Um, but also, I don't, again, if you're, YAML, YAML seems like the appropriate place to define RBAC rules. Um, don't ever mix any other projects with the pro project that you're trying to build your client-go code with because Kubernetes moves so much faster. So like we have, a, like our, I tried moving client-go into, or the dependencies into our main repo and we use a lot of Google libraries, and we use a lot of gRPC libraries. And we also have etcd. And all those three together just create this massive storm. Just, you cannot find the resolution of libraries to make all those things work. And unless you can match the velocity of the Kubernetes project, you're probably going to end up caught in a difficult place. And it just you won't be able to resolve the, de the, the dependency trees. So build your client-go library in its own project, and don't try and merge it in with any other projects. Um, a few things that we used to just kind of get us over the fence onto Kubernetes. Uh, we have a we use Kibana, or we use that used to be our only source of our only log storage. But um, there are things like Google Logger to our uh, stack driver logging technically. And that is one option, but the search functionality is a little bit underwhelming. And there are some nice features that people really like about Kibana, and uh, we wanted to keep those. So we actually used something that Glider Labs created. And I forked it and made a few minor modifications. If you are interested, I would be happy to show you how to make those changes as well. But effectively, it, 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 you create a daemon set, runs on every single node in your cluster, reads the logs from Docker, and then ships them straight to your elk, your elk cluster. But you don't need Logstash in any of this. It just writes the. Um, log files directly to Elasticsearch. And it just requires a simple mapping to make all that work, or Elasticsearch mapping. Um, and I deployed that six months ago, and I haven't had to touch it ever since. So as far as software goes, I'm pretty happy with that one. Um, event logger, originally, logs weren't bubbled up from like the useful Kubernetes events. So if you do kubectl get events, that's actually a useful stream of information to know about what your cluster is actually doing. Um, created a little tool just to read that out and write it to the logs. It's actually super useful. You can create metrics off of that. So when pods are dying and you don't know why, I, or if pods are dying, it's a good way to create a metric on it and then notify. Um, yeah, so you can alert from failures that show up in the event stream. Um, and then some simple, use, I used logarist JSON logging and then modified some simple things so that it worked well with uh, GKE logging, which effectively means you add a field and for severity. 
Um, this is kind of a un unique one, but if you use something like StatsD for metrics and graphite or carbon, uh, Prometheus is well designed in that you can take you can give it a list of pod names as like part of the part of the path for metrics and it handles that fine like it's, it writes it correctly but if you're using an older system like carbon it writes every single pa metrics path as a file system directory so if you use pods that will just if so if it's using pod IDs that's just going to explode um, so created a distributed effectively a naming uh, flattener. So you can effectively share different names. Um, so something that has a very, something that has a normal pod name that has a replica set and then a unique identifier, you can squash that down to just like one and then one, two, three, but then when pods exit, then they will uh, release that and then someone else can claim it when the nether pod starts up. So you effectively recycle the name set. Um, so the, and then the advancement of our CLI tool was something um, we called Ceph. Um, it's not the end goal, but it's a really useful tool for our staging environment because we do a lot of integration tests that run over like terabytes of data and then we look at the results and make sure that things are looking correct. Um, so to facilitate that, Ceph actually runs that deployment set and it's a simple uh, integration with Slack. You send it an update command and then you give it the tag and it will update, in this case, three different deployments with that tag. And those deployments roll out all the pods and you're up and running. So uh, this was pretty useful. It provides nice visibility to our staging environment so people don't like stomp on each other. And it's a nice uh, tool, but it is, again, you're issuing commands. It's not as clean as like something that is just reactive based on your GitHub. Uh, put, like, it's not something, something, it is a still a manual tool effectively at this point. So we want to get to the point where we're using like an operator pattern, but we're not quite there yet. But all the types are defined, so we are in a good position to actually move that way, and this is a nice step in that direction. We used Slack. That's a thing. Um, Slack is a difficult API to work with. I would cautiously recommend putting very strong interfaces around every interaction with Slack because who knows where that API is going to go. Um, but and it operate in its uh, des design is very similar to Helm's Tiller. So it sits in the cluster and communicates with the master, and then it uh, we issue commands to it. So. Um, and one thing, it, one nice thing about operators like that is you can apply guardrails. So you can do checks on like the current state of your application, or you can do checks to the command that you just issued. So validate that the image is in, has been built correctly by CI and is in the repository before you try and apply it, and then potentially take down a pod for no good reason. Um, yeah. So with that. I'm going to try and give you a short demo of actually using the client dash go library to do end-to-end -end testing without um, having to pass YAML files around and cat scripts. So, like, typically, whenever I see like some project, there's like, all right, to do end-to-end -end testing, you run this bash script, which evals this other bash script, and then the output of that, and you know, that runs a bunch of kubectl commands and applies them. So one of my, what I've been working on and committed to, I think, less than 40 minutes ago was this uh, project that I'm trying to build as a showcase for using client dash go. So, um, all right, so. Let's go to the actual test. So what this test is going to do, it's going to communicate with my local Minikube. Um, it's going to use that deployment that I showed you earlier. It's going to call this function create the deployment structure. We're going to create a connection to Minikube. And then we're going, like actually this is creating the connection. 
we're going to create that deployment. We're going to validate that it exists, which is not very sophisticated right now. But, and then we're going to delete it afterwards. So, and this is all in Go. There's no shelling out to do this. And then we're going to watch. So there, it created the deployment. There is the pod. And it should go to terminating pretty soon here. Or not. The demo gods are not being nice to me today. <laughs> oh, wait, no. OK, so it did delete it. The replica set is still going. Yes, all right. So the replica set is still, is still available, so which is why it's still, the pod is still there. So. And I also alias kubectl to ktl, so if that's what you're wondering what's going on. All right, so that was all in Go. No need to shell out and use a bunch of YAML files and kubectl to throw stuff around and check zero, zero codes. So um, using client-go is a bit of an interesting thing because it is a lot stickier and heavier to pick up than YAML because you can just copy a whole directory of YAML and run it against your cluster and see what happens. But I think it provides a lot of uh, insight into what is actually going on and it provides sanity for me like when you actually can look at the fields that you're trying to use and dig into them and see what everything is what see all the specifications for that type i think it's really useful um i think other people should explore it and especially now that it's not there's not so much wonkiness with versioning going on. I'm hoping from here on out we will have like complete feature sets for every release. So there'll be a new client-go version, which doesn't line up numerically, assembler-wise. But hopefully that'll tie very nicely to the upcoming Kubernetes releases going forward. I've been talking to a few. I talked to a few of the people working on client-go, and they sounded like hopefully from here on out it'll be solid. Um, GKA, uh, as far as our like actual migration, has been rock solid for us. Like. Upgrading has been super easy. Uh, we haven't really run into any issues. Like occasionally a kublet will die, and early, early days I did have to like go kill them every once in a while. But it's been rock solid for a long time. So if you are considering GK or Kubernetes managed systems, it's been pretty great for us. Um, so we eventually did make it to Kubernetes. Um, not everything went to plan. We didn't we didn't get all of our stack into Kubernetes yet, but. Uh, Elasticsearch is a fickle beast, and we haven't quite, I don't think anyone has quite figured out how to get Elasticsearch and Kubernetes yet. I haven't seen any like significant demos. Hopefully, stable sets will get us there at some point, but I know that there are some memory allocation issues that, gets, that come up. Um, but uh, for us, like the ability to use deployments and our stack actually fitting in deployments has been super useful. It alleviates a ton of burdensome operation time to actually get get our app out there and have it being resilient. Um, and like being able to over bin pack and let Kubernetes scheduler kind of handle our own uh, scheduler scheduling issues is really nice. So we can over we can oversubscribe to our compute resources and the Kubernetes scheduler allows us to uh, still have high availability without having to shove everything into vertical, uh, vertically scaled pods. Um, it's really nice when you're using client-go because you only have to interact with one API now. You don't have to interact with the, like, the compute API and then the image API um, for like typical cloud providers. And uh, it's it, like client-go is really nice. Um, so the theme of this conference has been Kubernetes is now some percentage more boring as infrastructure and hopefully won't be breaking so much going forward. Um, I'm really looking forward to service meshes and what those will provide us because like being able to, the Istio's TLS automatic, automatic encryption of traffic is going to be a big game changer and really nice. Um, and auto scaling and client re, or, and cluster resizing is going to be really nice going forward. 
So uh, that's all I got. Thank you.